السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد Welcome for a new episode of Quran in depth And this program again It's something that is intended for us to look closely into the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The best subject The miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is nothing more valuable in the life of a Muslim than to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. The most high, the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sent the Quran to be something between us and him subhanahu wa ta'ala. For us to hold fast to it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us. And as the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered us for the Quran to be a guide for us. To the, pre- to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Both revelations from the most high subhanahu wa ta'ala For us to hold fast to it To get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us This is the first step that we need to take When a person wants to take the path That the end of it is the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We have to get to ponder over the verses of the Quran To get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so that after that we would apply and submit ourselves totally. As we mentioned before, submission, it's not a simple thing. Submission, a person might submit to falsehood. And that's why we need to submit to the truth. When you submit, that means you don't put forward your own intellect, your opinions, your desires. You submit whether you see the wisdom or whether you don't see the wisdom. This is the meaning of submission. But if a person, every time he wants to do something, he would see the benefit of doing that thing in his immediate life, for example, that it fits his own desire and so on and so forth, this is not full submission. So the full submission that we were ordered to do, Islam, to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this comes in the meaning of surrendering. But imagine a person surrendering or submitting to falsehood. This is a disaster. That's why comes the importance of knowledge. We need to know the truth, so that once we know for sure that this is the truth, then we have nothing but the submission and the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the purpose of this program. This is something that we have to take seriously, that our life changes according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, the same way that the companions radiallahu anhum did to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would ask the Prophet ﷺ, they would get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them. As Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when we heard this tradition before more than one time, and it's important to repeat it all the time, to get to see the way of the companions radiallahu anhu. They would learn ten verses after ten verses. And as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, فَتَعَلَّمْنَا الْعِلْمَ وَالْعَمَلَ جَمِيعًا That we learned knowledge and actions together. It was hand in hand, knowledge and actions. So this is the part when we need to learn. And then the actions, it's something that on, for each and every one of us, we become responsible how to act according to what we learned. So we need to take the Qur'an in our life, in our speech, in our actions, in buying and selling, in dealing with the closest people to us, the furthest ones, to the enemies, to the friends, how to deal with all variables in our lives. All of that is according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, wants from us through the two revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi So we're about 
now to get to start with the verses of the Quran, to learn the meanings of the verses of the Quran. Uh, but before we start that, which inshallah will start with the next segment, what are the, some of the etiquettes when it comes to reciting the Quran? Very briefly, although it might take long time, but this is very briefly. This is the words of Allah, this is the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result of that, we need to give it so much respect. And the respect is not again according to our own desires or intellects. It's according to the way of the Prophet ﷺ. No one would respect the Qur'an more than the Prophet ﷺ. And as a result of that, we follow his way ﷺ. It is something that is important for us when we carry the Mus'haf, when we touch the Qur'an, that we become in state of wudu. And this is the opinion of the Jumhur, the majority of the ulama, that for you to open the Qur'an, to carry the Qur'an, the Mus'haf, that it starts from Surah Al-Fatiha till Surah Al-Nas, we need to be in the state of wudu. But if you're opening a translated version of the Qur'an, that means the human being's uh, version of it is more than the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as a fact, if you find, for example, the translation in English, the words in the translated Qur'an is far more than what is written which is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is okay as the ulama they say, to open it and to read the translation from it, or even the Arabic, which is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to open a mushaf that has only the Arabic, which is the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means we need to have wudu, to be in the state of wudu, purification. If a person recites the Qur'an without touching the Qur'an, then there is no harm of reciting it without being in the state of wudu. But if a person is in the state of janaba, which needs ghusl, and this is, again, this is not a fiqh lesson, but this is briefly, then a person is not supposed to even recite the Qur'an till he takes the shower. Women in their menses, as the ulama, they say, they can read the Qur'an, they can recite the Qur'an, but without touching the mushaf that has only the Arabic language, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that is from the etiquettes of reciting the Qur'an. It is recommended to face the Qibla if it's easy. But again, don't make such a thing prevent a person from reciting the Qur'an because a person can recite the Qur'an in whatever direction a person can face. Also, it's important to have the proper intentions. The proper intentions to recite the Qur'an is to seek the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. As we heard from before, that reciting one letter is equal to 10 rewards, 10 hasanat as the Prophet ﷺ gave us this good news on how to utilize our time in which every day we get to get of these treasures of the Qur'an. Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they used to recite the Qur'an frequently to some extent that it was narrated that the companions radiallahu anhum, they would finish the Qur'an, it was famous among them that they would recite the whole Qur'an in seven days. This is something for someone that had mastered the Qur'an. Someone that uh, know how to recite the Qur'an perfectly. A person would recite so many hours the day of the Qur'an that they would finish the Qur'an in seven days. How would they do that? The first uh, three surahs after Surah Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa, the first long surahs in one day, and then the next day they would recite five surahs, and then seven surahs, and then uh, nine, and then eleven, and then thirteenth, and then the last day from Surah Qaf to the end. Something of that nature. But again, this is a level that, by the will of Allah, a person can reach it. But the first level, we need to take the matter step by step. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, that the one that recites the Qur'an, وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقٍ وَهُوَ يَتَتَعْتَعُ فِي The one that recites the Qur'an, and it's difficult, and he's having a hard time being able to recite every letter, he will get double of the reward. One reward for recitation, and one reward for the effort that we put in, to, so that we recite the Qur'an. والماهر بالقرآن مع السفرة الكرام البرر. As the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the one that recites the Quran perfectly is with the scribes. This is the highest level. This is what we need to reach, and the mean to reach this high level is also something that a person will get great rewards, as we heard from the Hadith. So having the proper intentions and also to ponder over the verses of the Quran to get to know what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants from us. So uh, these are some of the etiquettes and the ulama they mentioned more 
than just these etiquettes, but it's important for us to remember that this is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and inshallah ta'ala will start from the very beginning. And when we start from the very beginning of the Qur'an, we usually, from the etiquettes of reciting the Qur'an, the first thing that we say, we say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Which means I seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. This is al-isti'adha. This is not a verse in the Qur'an. If you open the Qur'an, you won't see written in it, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ By the way, when you open the Qur'an, and Mus'haf al-Imam or so, you would only find what Uthman radiallahu anhu and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ had agreed to write in the same way of writing, which is mandatory for us to write the Qur'an in such a way. And you would find only what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were ordered to write. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved in every letter of it. So you won't see there, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. But why do we say أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم before we start reciting the Quran? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Most High, He ordered us in the Quran to do that. إذا قرأت القرآن فاستعذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. If you recite the Quran, then seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. And the Prophet ﷺ would do that, and the companions رضي الله عنهم would do that. So as a result, out of the etiquettes of reciting the Qur'an, the first thing that we do is that we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the cursed shaitan. So it's not a verse in the Qur'an. This is something only that we should say before we recite the Qur'an, as we heard, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Qur'an. What do we say? We say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Which means, I seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. Once we get to Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then Surah al-Fatiha, it's good to get a Qur'an and to open it and to recite, to see the letters and how to recite it, uh, so that we can have this uh, proper understanding, inshallah ta'ala. But first, with the isti'adha, which is called isti'adha, it means you seek in refuge. When you say, A'udhu billah, that means you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeking refuge or al-isti'adha is an act of worship. It's an act of worship, and as we know, that the acts of worship has to be done only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of la ilaha illallah. So we need to live these meanings when we're saying a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim that you're doing an act of worship with your heart and your tongue. You're stating the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that we seek refuge in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high is the only one that we seek refuge in. Not a human being, none but the creator of the heavens and the earth. So this is an act of worship, the issue of al-isti'adha. You say, A'udhu Billahi. When you say, A'udhu Billahi, meaning that I seek refuge in Allah. Allah, the Most High, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has in it all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this unique name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the ulama they mentioned, that it has a root meaning to it, although it has a differences of opinion, but the correct opinion that it has a root meaning to it. And the root meaning of the word Allah is the one to be worshipped. Is the one to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. And the evidence of that actually it's something that is mentioned in the Quran in one of the recitation of the Quran as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma recited the ayah Wayadaraka wa ilahatak. The verse is وَيَذَرَكْ وَأَلِهَتَكْ But in another authentic recitation he would say وَيَذَرَكْ وَإِلَاهَتَكْ Which, just to make it easy, that it means the word إله means the one to be worshipped. The one to be worshipped. So the word Allah means the one to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. And from this we would get to know the proper meaning of لا إله إلا الله. The word La ilaha illallah does not mean there is no creator but Allah, although He is the only creator and He is the only sustainer. But the meaning of La ilaha linguistically, the word ilaha and the word Allah, ilaha means the one to be worshipped. So there is no one worthy of worship except Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that deserves to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. 
So this is the meaning of A'udhu Billahi, which means I seek refuge in the one that deserves to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from who? From our fiercest enemy. من الشيطان الرجيم From the shaytan. The shaytan is the devil, is Satan. And we're not going to get into the story of the shaytan because we will get to that later on inshallah ta'ala. But this is something that should make us think. This is the first thing before reciting the Quran that we are seeking refuge in Allah from the cursed shaytan. He is the fierce enemy. He is our worst enemies because he goes into the bloodstream. He is the one that whispers to us to do what is evil. So we need to seek this protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the shaytan. Because if a person is protected from the whispers of shaytan, that means he would do what is good and he would be among those who would ponder over the verses of the Qur'an. So we'll get back inshallah ta'ala after the break with more of the meanings of al-isti'adha and then we get to go to Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We'll be right back, so stay where you are inshallah ta'ala. So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ba'd. Welcome back. We're still with A'udhu Billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Again, it's not a verse of the Qur'an, but this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us so that we say before we recite the Qur'an. We're getting ready to recite the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the way to get ready for such a great task is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to seek the protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most high, the most powerful subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the cursed shaitan, the number one enemy to the human being. The one that was the reason for our forefather Adam alayhi salam to be ousted of Jannah and to be on the face of earth and for us to go through the test that we are going through by the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are tested in this life and those who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they would enter the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who followed the ways of the shaitan they accepted the whispers of the shaitan they would be among the people of the hellfire as it's mentioned clearly in the book of Allah and in the sunnah of the Prophet So this is the proper preparation for us. We're preparing our heart by turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone by stating the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship. This is the tawheed, the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need to observe with our own hearts and our own tongues. And we seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. The word shaitan or the devil or Satan literally means the one that is far away. Far away from what? Far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's been kicked out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of refusing to prostrate to Adam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him as it will come in Surah Al-Baqarah inshallah ta'ala. So this is a reminder for us. What is the effect of saying A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim in our heart, we state the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship, that He is our protector, and also brings in the heart the reminder that shaitan is our enemy, that we need to protect ourselves from the shaitan. But shaitan, he sees us, and we cannot see him. So he has an advantage now over the human being, because if he can see you, if he can run into the bloodstream of one's uh, body, that means it can be very tricky. How can we separate and differentiate between the whispers of shaitan and our own thoughts? And how can that be clearly differentiated for us? The only way that we can be protected from shaitan is by seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by getting to know the ways of shaitan, the ways of the devil. How can we get to know the ways of the shaitan? From the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet. Are the enemies in one's life 
It's all explained in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ how to protect ourselves from our own enemies. As we mentioned before, we have two tasks in our life that we're supposed to do and to endure patience in fulfilling. One of which is to push away the harm by knowing the enemies, those who are trying to attack your hearts, those who are trying to impurify our hearts, to prevent it from seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, to make us among the people of the hellfire, wal-a'adhu billah. So this is one task that we need to do in our life, to purify ourselves, to protect ourselves from all that, that is evil. And the second thing is to adorn ourselves, to adorn our hearts with the beauty of the Qur'an, with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, with our good deeds and the actions and so on. And they both go hand, hand in hand. We have to do both in our life. And this is something that we get to learn what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us with regarding to the shaytan. Shaytan have steps. And this is also something that we would see in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned the believers not to follow the steps of the shaytan. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوُّ مُبِينٌ Which means, O mankind, eat from the pure things, the permissible things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for you and do not follow the steps of shaytan. Indeed, he is a clear enemy to you. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. This is something for us to act according to it. He said, do not follow the steps of shaitan. If you are a pious person, if you are a righteous Muslim, shaitan won't come to you and he won't say, drink wine, commit fornication, disbelief or whatever there is. He would come step by step and he would come in a sneaky way. Why? To try to take away from you the iman, the faith, but he doesn't do that all of, at once. He would take a step after a step. But the goal of the shaitan, and this is very dangerous, the goal of the shaitan is not just for you to commit a sin. The hope of the shaitan is to take the person outside the fold of Islam. To make the person dies in the state of kufr, the state of disbelief, for the person to be like the shaitan, to be in the hellfire forever. Imagine this is the hope of the shaitan. And he comes to you and he's not losing this hope. When we think that we are secure from that, the shaitan is not. And he's doing the best he can to take each and every individual outside the fold of Islam, knowing that by itself would make us take the enmity of the shaitan seriously. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Every time we recite the Qur'an, that means we take the shaitan seriously. That means we have to take the shaitan as an enemy. Because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Qur'an. فَاتَّخِذُوهُ adawwa. That means, take the shaitan as an enemy. It is not enough to know that he is your enemy. You have to take him as an enemy. You have to have the, the, the proper weapons to defend yourself from the whispers of the shaitan, and one of which is to seek the refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the whispers of the shaitan and to get to know the ways of the shaitan. So the shaitan goes in steps. He goes and tells the person, uh, why not just uh, commit these disliked acts? It's not haram for you to do this. And if a person falls into the disliked acts, then he would tell him, why don't you commit this small sin? It's not something that is major. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiver. And a person, if he obeys the shaitan and becomes in the state and the level in which he would commit minor sins, and then the heart will have the persistency, which is an attitude that is a major sin in itself then falling into the major sins, then falling into matters of shirk and associating partners with Allah, then falling in matters of bid'ah innovation in the religion of Islam, then falling into kufr wal billah, all of that is because of the steps of the shaitan that he takes the person gradually, one step after the other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us, and inshallah we'll get to learn the tricks of shaitan so that we protect ourselves from it, as it's mentioned in the Quran. But again, just by saying, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al-rajim, we realize that the only way that we will be protected from the ways of the shaitan is to turn sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, to seek the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because every creation of Allah, the one that is in control of it, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا مِن دَابَّةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ آخِذٌ بِنَاصِيَتِهَا That every single life, 
every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in full control of it. So as a result of that, why should a person fear a creation of Allah? A Muslim should only fear the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why should a Muslim turn to a creation? A person should turn to the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. He subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that is capable of making those of your enemies, making away from you and make you defeat them by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The cursed shaitan, he is cursed. He's away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? As a result of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a result of the kibr and the arrogance that he uh, had. And as a result of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kicked him out of his mercy till the day of judgment. And the shaitan took it upon himself after the permission of Allah that he would deviate the human beings. He would deviate them except those who are sincere. And again, this is something that we would see throughout the verses of the Qur'an. So the first state of our mind that we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the cursed shaitan and as an advice to myself and you as the viewer is to concentrate on this when we're reciting the Qur'an. We say that before we recite the Qur'an as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us also is to be said in the salah. But in the salah is to be said silently and not to be said out loud if the salah is to be recited loud like Maghrib, Isha or Fajr the Imam should not say out loud A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim but he should say it silently to himself but not out loud where people would hear it and the same thing for ourselves when we recite do we say that only in the first rak'ah of the salah? you can say it in the second rak'ah also as the ulama they say but if it's only in the first rak'ah this is MashaAllah is good so we say it in the salah we say it uh, outside the salah when we are reciting the Qur'an when we are about to recite the Qur'an this is the preparation that we need to have to push away the shaitan so that we can get the benefit from reciting the Qur'an the knowledge and the action and again these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to have the proper heart the proper cleanliness so that we receive the benefit from the Qur'an after that if you open the mushaf and if you have it in front of you you would see written the first verse written in the Qur'an is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and most of the versions of the Qur'an that you would say you would see number one next to it so the first thing is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim we need also to learn how to recite it so you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim which translate that it means in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful or the most beneficent the most merciful depend on which translation that you are looking at so is this a verse of the Quran you would see it written is it a verse of the Quran yes and the ulama they had differences of opinion whether it's a verse of Surah Al-Fatiha that means the sum of the verses in Surah Al-Fatiha is seven with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim or it's a verse in the Quran but a separate verse that starts every surah so every surah, every chapter of the Qur'an starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as a verse, but it's not part of the surah. It's a separate verse, a standalone verse, if it's correct to say that. So it is a verse of the Qur'an, but the differences of opinion is whether it's a verse of Surah Al-Fatiha or not. So that nobody would say, is there's differences of opinion with regarding to the verses of the Qur'an? No, this is a verse of the Qur'an. But the only differences of opinion, whether it's a verse of Surah Al-Fatiha or a separate verse that we say before we recite Surah Al-Fatiha. But anyway, it's a verse in the Qur'an. What is the meaning of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? That we need to benefit from and we need to get the understanding of it and how Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim would affect our life. We learn from A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim that in our life we need to take the enmity of the Shaitan seriously before we take any actions, we need to know whether this is the ways of the shaitan or the ways of the truth. The way of the Prophet ﷺ, we get to know that by knowledge, clear knowledge. And we need to seek the refuge and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of our affairs to be away from the cursed shaitan. Now when we get to Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, Bismillah. Bismillah meaning, the word ism meaning name. And the root of it comes from the meaning of uh, something that is high, something that has been chosen. 
and the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's usually used for uh, name so the name of so and so this is the word ism so when you say bismillah by the name by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this means that as if you are saying I seek the blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by mentioning his name that I'm about to start reciting the Quran we have been recommended in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to say Bismillah in many things. Actually, before doing anything, it is recommended that we started by saying Bismillah. When you enter a mosque, a masjid, you would say Bismillah and the rest of the dhikr. When you enter your home, you say the same thing. When you put clothes on, you would say Bismillah. When you would enter even the bathroom coming out, you would say Bismillah. When you get into your transportation, whether it's a car or an animal, you say Bismillah. Even to the extent of which if something that you don't like happens, you say Bismillah. As it's mentioned in the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. When your trans- transportation, when your dabba, the atharat, meaning if your dabba had uh, stopped or something happened to it, if you curse the shaitan, the shaitan becomes so huge, as big as a house. He likes that. Shaitan likes for you to curse him in when you're angry. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, but if you say Bismillah, the shaitan becomes very humiliated and very small. So that as a result of that, it's recommended for us, even when something bad happens to us, immediately to say Bismillah. For example, you see your child fall into the ground, say Bismillah. This is something that is recommended for us to say all the time. So when you're reciting the Qur'an, as if you're saying, by the name of Allah, I would recite the Qur'an. You won't say that, but this is what your intentions when you say Bismillah. When you're, before you're eating, we say Bismillah. And if a person doesn't say that, the shaitan sharing with you your food. And if he shares the food with you, that means it would lose its blessings. And the same thing when you don't say Bismillah, when you enter your house or your home, the shaitan would have a share in your home, he will come into your home and we know when, when the shaitan is present what he brings with him he brings all that is evil so when a person enters his home it is the sunnah the way of the Prophet ﷺ is to say Bismillah when you enter so when you enter the home as if you're saying by the name of Allah I enter by the name of Allah I'm eating by the name of Allah I drink and so on and so forth although we don't say this we only say Bismillah so when we say Bismillah it means in the name of of Allah, witnessing the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our life, realizing that we are nothing but slaves of Allah that we need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high at all times, you go to your home, you go to your car, you eat, you drink, this is what every human beings do, but we as Muslims, we are slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of your occasions and one of which when you recite the Quran so that we have this proper connection because everything in our life has to be according to the purpose of our, of our life, which is ibadah. And that we would make us understand also that ibadah is not just that you have to stand necessarily in salah, that you have to be necessarily doing a, 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 an act of worship, is in all of our affairs. By just saying bismillah in all of our affairs, we're doing acts of worship by doing that and fulfilling our purpose of our life. In the next segment, inshallah ta'ala, we'll uh, continue to discuss the meaning of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim so that we get to understand the first verse of Surah Al-Fatiha Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim so stay where you at inshallah ta'ala so that we get to understand more of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us in the Quran <laughs> has taken another step towards delivering its very informative programs to a wider international audience. For the first time in an effort to bring our programming to Europe, Huda TV is now broadcasting on Hotbird. Our viewers can now watch Huda TV according to the following perimeters. Hotbird 8, 13 degrees east. Frequency, double one, five, double six. Polarization, horizontal. Symbol rate, two, seven, five, double zero. FEC, 
three over four. Huda TV, a light in every home. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, welcome back. We're still with the uh, first verse in the Quran and explaining its meanings and how that should affect our life and should change our life. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, without any exaggeration, every verse in the Quran, since it's a miracle in itself, should be enough for us to change our life. To change our life to the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. We heard from when we said, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim how that has the meaning of the tawheed, the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows our enemies and how to protect ourselves from the enemies. And all of these meanings is all ways of protection, ways that a Muslim needs to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The same thing when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we got to know when to say Bismillah in all of our affairs by witnessing the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unto us all around us, that we need to be in constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our heart and our tongue. And we say that all the time, this is an action here that we learn from Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that we need to say it all the time, to say it in all of our affairs, so that it comes from our heart and our tongues, and this is also something that brings the Tawheed, the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it's in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only one that deserves to be worshipped subhanahu wa ta'ala with the perfect love and the perfect submission. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the same thing with ar-Rahim. And there are many names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as we know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa إن لله تسعة وتسعين اسما من أحصاها دخل الجنة that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are 99 names whoever comprehend them or memorize it he would enter the Jannah and this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said these 99 names meaning something that we get to know in this life although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have more than that but this is something for us to get to know from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it is not permissible for someone to invent a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only what is mentioned in the Quran and in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So Ar-Rahman is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman, which means the most beneficent, the most gracious subhanahu wa ta'ala. This name has an attribute as all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important knowledge that we need to understand. Every name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just letters, alif, lam, ra, Ha'mim Noon, it's, it's a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it means an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something for us to learn the meanings of it and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ar-Rahman comes from the attribute of mercy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful and Ar-Rahman meaning the most gracious but again, the root meaning of it is the one that has the perfect mercy, and that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we are subjecting ourselves to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are seeking the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying that, because He is the most merciful. He is the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He said subhanahu wa ta'ala that His mercy is closer to those who are good doers. إِنَّ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ مِّنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very close to those who are muhsineen, to the good doers. So if we need to have the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to be among the good doers. But the word ar-Rahman, which is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has a unique nature to it, different than the rest of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is a name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah. قُلِ ادْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوِدْعُوا الرَّحْمَنِ That say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether you call unto Allah or Ar-Rahman. So this also is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is mentioned even without uh, mentioning the effect of it or the attribute of it, although it means the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the mercy. 
That's why a human being can have some mercy, can be Rahim, which is the next one. But a human being cannot be Rahman. This is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know some of the attributes of Allah, a human being can acquire these attributes, but nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People have mercy towards one another. But is this mercy of the human being is the same as the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of course not. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِي شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know the meaning of it, we do not deny it, we believe in it, but we do not resemble it to any of the attributes of the human being, and we don't say that it's the like of the attributes of the human being, because nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the same thing. So Ar-Rahman is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Ar-Rahim, another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means the most merciful. The most merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? If both names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the same meaning that comes and it's derived from the word mercy, or rahma or Ar-Rahim, which is the womb of the mother. And it comes from the word the mercy, meaning the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ulama, they mentioned the many things, one of which that Ar-Rahman is an attribute or the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that, does it, that it means the extended mercy, the effect of it to the human being is in Ar-Rahim. But Ar-Rahman is the mercy itself which is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ar-Rahim is the effect of that mercy. That he is the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the effect of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of the creation of Allah. Another meaning that Ar-Rahman means the one that has the mercy to all of his creation. In this life and in the hereafter. Ar-Rahim is a special mercy. And that is to the believers only in the day of judgment. There is an authentic hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created hundred parts of mercy. And we have to pay attention that this is different than the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The attribute of Allah is not the creation of Allah. The attribute of Allah refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created hundred parts of mercy which is different than the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created hundred parts of mercy. One of these hundred parts of this mercy is how the people and the animals on the face of earth, they have mercy towards one another. To the extent of which when an animal lifts its foot so that it doesn't hurt its offspring, this mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put into the heart and in the nature of even the animals, this is only one part of a hundred parts of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. The mercy that you would find in the heart of every mother towards her child, whether she's a Muslim or a non-Muslim, whether she is in the east or in the west, they all have this mercy towards their children. Who created this mercy in her heart is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most merciful. All of this mercy divided throughout all the human beings and the animals from the creation of the human beings till the day of judgment. It's only one part of hundred parts. And the 99 parts that is left, the Prophet sallallahu said, that will be saved for the believers in the day of judgment. Subhanallah. See how the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for the believers. This mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shower the believers, the 99 parts, only for the believers in the day of judgment. So Ar-Rahman can be understood that he is the most beneficent, the most gracious, the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of his creation. The disbelievers are being fed, are being provided for. They are given life, they are given wealth, they are given happiness in this life. All of that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the owner of all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of all things. So he gave the disbelievers. And this is by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what purpose? For them to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, to worship him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is when it comes to the effect of Ar-Rahman. All the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have a share of this mercy. They witness it, they see it in their lives and so on. But Ar-Rahim, which has the same root meaning, Something that is special for the believers in the Day of Judgment. 
What is the effect in our hearts? We didn't even start reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. We're still in A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajeem. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. We are already prepared to get to the next verses of the Qur'an by having certain meanings in our hearts. These verses should change our whole entire life. It taught us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Because he's the only one that we seek refuge in. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala that we mention his name. In his name we do everything. Because he's the owner of all things. And he's the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the most beneficent subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means what? That means we need to subject ourselves to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to have this mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being good doers, by subjecting ourselves to it. It brings in the heart of the Muslim also that we should be shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that how can a person after getting to know the vast mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still persistently commit sins and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And live a life of forgetfulness. And not to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's the most merciful. When he's the one that protects you in the womb of your mother. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'alamuna shay'a. Wa ja'ala lakum al-sam'a wal-abusara wal-af'idata la'allakum tashkurun. That he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that brought you out from the womb of your mothers, not knowing anything. We had no knowledge when we came out of the wombs of our mothers, and he gave you the hearing and the sight, for what purpose? So that you are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we remember that, that the one that took care of us when we were in the womb of our mothers, the one that created this mercy in the hearts of the mothers to take care of her own child, in which if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took this mercy away from her, if she gets angry, with her child, if she, for example, kills the child, who would protect this child? You won't be able to protect yourself when you're that weak, when you just came out of the womb of your mother. But who is the one that protected you? He is the one that protected us, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most strongest human being, the tyrants, when they were babies, when they were just born, they were helpless. And who took care of them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By His vast mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this something that brings the shyness in the heart, that the person would humble himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it doesn't make sense that when a person grows up and to have means of uh, sustenance and, have to, and having some power and energy all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have some intellect, then a person would use this power and this intellect to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is so much injustice. And that's why the human being commits so much forms of injustice. As a result of what? As a result of not being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. When people disobey him subhanahu wa ta'ala, when people disbelieve in him and still he showers them with his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. He still feeds them. He still provides for them. And he still gives them the chance to repent to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person at the time of Ali radiallahu an, uh, a thief, he was caught, and they were about to cut his hand. And Ali radiallahu anhu asked him, tell me, be truthful, is this your first time? The man denied he did not want to answer, thinking that he might be freed or so. But then after the capital punishment had been done to him, he answered and he said, it wasn't the first time. So Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, I know that this is wasn't the first time. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. He gave, you, he gave you chances to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then a Muslim should not be deceived by this vast mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should make the Muslim actually the total opposite. Not deceived by the mercy of Allah. Not ignoring the mercy of Allah and saying, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Let's disobey him and commit sins. Actually, it brings the opposite of that in the heart of the Muslim. It should make the Muslim shy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he's the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I'm the most weak and when the human being committed sins, and we all committed sins, nobody's perfect. And these sins would remind the Muslim if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treat us with his justice, we all be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that if the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be served 
in the day of judgment only with regarding to ourselves. We committed sins, even if it's a small sin, at one point of our life. If we are dealt with the justice of Allah alone, that means we will be punished. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. We are in need of the mercy of Allah. And as a result of that, we need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone to gain this mercy. To have this mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be saved from the hellfire. And this is a meaning that should be present in our heart when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. See how much effect and how much cleansing of the heart that we need to go through and the effect of reciting just Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that we recite before we recite every surah in the Quran. We already, we should, our heart should be clean, purified, ready to have the benefits of what is mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha, in Surah Al-Baqarah, in any surah. So once we sit and recite the Quran, we say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. We are in such a high state. We protected ourselves by the will of Allah from the whispers of Shaitan. We worship none but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala alone for fulfilling the Tawheed. We are subjecting ourselves to the mercy of Allah. We see ourselves as humble human beings. We are in need of the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the more we humble ourselves, the more we fulfill the purpose of our creation to be abd, to be a servant and a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the qualities that would make the person benefit from the Qur'an and then the person would submit himself or herself perfectly to the creator of the heavens and the earth. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. Inshallah ta'ala next time we have the program life and we can accept, uh, receive your calls if you have any concerns, any questions with regarding to the meanings of the verses of the Qur'an, so that we have this interaction, so that the Qur'an is not just something that we recite to get some benefits of the letters to be recited, but we need to ponder. We need to uh, relate the Qur'an to our daily lives and how to be steadfast on the deen of Islam, whether we are 1400 years after the Prophet ﷺ, or whether whatever time, whatever state, wherever you are at, we need to be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So please join us inshallah ta'ala next time. Until then, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, accept our deeds and to guide us to do what is right and to forgive our sins. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كفلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كبيرا فلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا